Chapter 19 The Fire Point It was not difficult for Hale to excuse himself, as he was not engaged in conversation like the others. He imagined his companions did not even make note of his departure, except for Adamantus, whose large eyes followed him from across the room as he stepped around a cluster of laughing elves and slipped out through the stone archway they had entered through earlier in the evening. His eyes still not fully adjusted to the dark of the night woods, he stumbled once off the paved path. He spread his arms out, feeling for the trunks to his left and right until he had some idea of the space. Then he saw her. He had no doubt that she wanted to be seen. Otherwise, with her soft footfalls and liquid movements, she easily could have disappeared into the night. He opened his mouth to greet her, but he stubbed his toe on a root and nearly fell over instead. She smiled. But as she did so, the bandage on her face crinkled and her smile faded like a child's chalk drawing washed away by rain. She seemed to recede back into the shadow before speaking. You watched me today, at the ceremony, she said. I did, he said, deciding there was no use in lying. And you spent the day playing with Sandalin and Mayleaf's elflings, and sleeping in the sun. Seems I was followed as well. You were, but you did not come out. She was quiet a while, brooding. No. Hale expected an explanation. He did not get one, but then again the bandage was explanation enough. She turned to walk away. He was afraid he had offended her, and was vexed at why. Girls were so difficult to understand, perhaps even more so if they were elves, he thought. To his relief, she turned. Come on, follow me. He did so. Hale felt like a kitten following a string. She moved through the passages among the trees without a sound. Occasionally they passed through an empty plaza, lit by the same torches giving off silver-blue light. But as they neared, the torches would fade, only to light again once they had moved beyond them. As a result, they moved in a shell of darkness. He had no doubt that it somehow was Violin's work. He stumbled a few times, which were the only times she would look back, allowing him to see her face. The rest of the time she was turned away, making her hard to see, her black garments topped with locks of black hair melting seamlessly into the dark. There was no denying the fact that he could not keep up. At times he followed in the light of the relit torches, only guessing where she was in the darkness ahead. Finally she stopped and waited under a smoldering lantern. Hale came up panting. A small door waited, carved into the bowl of the tree before her. Violin stooped under the lantern, reached to her face, and drew the bandage away, watching him closely for his reaction. The wound was awful, the skin torn in three gashes, the tendons of her face beneath exposed. Was that bone he could see through the cleaved muscle? Whatever it was, her cheek was ruined. He felt a twinge of discomfort, a shivering from his throat down to his toes, accompanied by a guilty sense of voyeurism. Violin's own expression was inscrutable, reproachful, challenging. The light, the way her facial muscles had been destroyed, made it impossible to tell. She finally turned her eyes back to the doorway. Stuffing the bandage away and leaving her wound open to the air, she said, This is the way then pushed in through the door. Her voice was strange, more certain now, as if she had stripped away a certain inhibition when she had drawn away the bandage. They went up twisting corridors, bored right into the columns of the tree. As they rose up and up, passing by holes and windows, Hale felt gusts of cool air and heard the sounds of the nighttime forest. In a few places, the tunnel branched off into two directions— Violin slowed there, letting him catch up before she continued on. These are the tunnels I used to run through as a child, to escape from my brothers and their friends. They were always picking on me as an elfling. Until you were old enough to fight back. Until I was old enough to beat them. As they rose higher, the tunnel grew steeper so that Hale couldn't help but crawl. He guessed that it would have taken a brave elfling to climb so high at a young age. 
The passage grew airier as the walls became a latticework of interlocking branches. Soon they were crawling up stairs made of the very branches themselves, branches as thick as a leg, as thick as forearms, then just as thick as fingers. Hill looked left and right. Beyond the immediate branches were stars that hung like fruit of the trees between the boughs. As the branches continued to thin, the leaves became busier with the growing breeze, and then it was all gone. The sky opened up all around him with a wind that was like a gasp. Stars as numerous as the sand upon the beach tumbled over each other in the sky, all the way to the edge of night on the horizon. All around them were the endless undulating treetops that swayed like ocean waves and made a sound like rain falling. It was a sound he realized he had been hearing all day, except from far below. The top of the tree had been flattened to grow into a platform. Violin walked along it a few feet ahead of him, her body bouncing as if on a wire. Hale reached down to feel what darkness they were walking upon. It was a solid interweaving of branches. He probed it for holes, and any he found were no deeper than half a finger. He took a few unsure steps. The floor was springy, giving slightly. Violin stood just at the edge, the leaves of the forest whispering below her. He came up alongside, testing his weight. She took no notice of him, and when he looked into her eyes, he saw that they were remote. He chose to respect her silence and looked away. The stars were of all colors, red, blue, gold. He never would have believed they could possess so many different hues. It was like looking on stars with whole new personalities, completely different from the cold ice faces he had gazed upon from his chamber window. These were hot and varied like jewels. The ones on the edge of the horizon wavered and shimmered like insistent embers, smoldering in the thicker, lower air of the earth. They call this place the Fire Point, Violin said, her eyes still engaged in the sky. When I was young, I imagined it was named so because here the stars look as if they are on fire. They do. So is that the reason? She shrugged. Most likely it was because this place was used to signal another tower like it, farther in the woods with firelight. But my father never told me that. He let me go on believing it was named after what I imagined. She paused and looked to Hale as if to measure his response before she continued. He was that sort of man, who would gladly indulge imagination, to revel in it, then to bother about fact. Facts are for humans, he used to say. Ghislaine Alistair, that was his name. He was a human. Human? Hence my name, Crossborn. Father was extraordinary. Caring, gentle, giving, but also dangerous. We knew he was a great fighter, but we knew not why or from where he had learned his skills. He seemed loath to teach us such arts, but as Vorgs moved closer to our lands, we began to glimpse his knowledge. It was prodigious. He taught us all how to defend ourselves, even though it was against his wishes that we should live in a world where we had to. He was a man in love with the beauty of the world, not violence. She stared downward, her chin nearly on her breast, then looked up again into the stars, a smile now on her lips. Once, upon finding bumblebees burrowing into a bench in our house, instead of dropping oil into the holes to kill them, he disassembled the bench and mounted it in glass on our wall so we could watch the bees progress as they laid eggs, grew larvae, and created a nest. I remember him holding me up on his shoulders to watch. It is no wonder my mother was willing to marry outside her kind for him. I did not know my mother, Hale said, looking down and tapping at the branches idly with his foot. Her hand moved to his elbow, anticipating that he was going to step forward towards the edge. He was not, but he stepped back anyway, and felt disappointed as she removed her hand and its pressure. My father is all I have left, he continued, which is why I want to tear through these woods to reach him. 
She was staring directly into his face, and he felt somewhat conspicuous. She pointed to the horizon. That is south, where Carith lies. There he waits. Hill turned. He had lost any sense of direction climbing up the tree. All the views from the top looked the same to him, but now this horizon seemed different, simply from the knowledge that under those smoldering stars was a camp where his father lay asleep. The anxiety from earlier returned, but this time he found his words flowing, his thoughts open. And yet, I don't even know how he will receive me. What do you mean? Violin said, turning her face to him. His gaze fell to her wound. I... I suffer the shaking sickness. I don't know if you elves are afflicted with it, but I fall into seizures unexpectedly. In my father's eyes, I'm weak of body, of character. I'm broken. He was ready to send me away before... before I ran away. You ran away? To find a cure but I gave it to Caitlin instead, to save her from a fatal wound. Violin said nothing, instead taking a deep breath. For a while they both watched the leaves twist in the breeze at their feet. Then she is indebted to you. We are friends. Even though I have not always been a good one, she would do the same for me. I see. She was quiet for another long pause before she cleared her throat. You will leave tomorrow, with or without the Elder's approval. How is that? I will lead you through the woods, whether they agree to it or not. Why would you do that for me? You hardly know me. She turned to him, a flash of anger in her eyes. He pressed forward nonetheless. I could be no different from the other conquerors descended of Hilary Hilborn. What about the repercussions? the reprisals your own people would take upon you. They matter nothing to me, and don't insult me by inferring that I could not deal with my people and their disapproval. I have faced it my whole life, being a cross-born, she said, her tone firm. I'm sorry. I did not mean to offend. I just wondered why you would grant me such kindness, being who I am. Now it was her face that turned away. He thought it was out of anger, and he regretted ruining the candor of the moment, but when she spoke, her voice was timid. There is a question of what connects us now. You and your friends saved my life, but your ancestor betrayed my people. As a race we may be opposed, but as individuals perhaps we are friends. I am at least in your debt and obliged to fulfill it. I would like to be friends. She nodded, turning to him, a glimmer in the corner of her eyelashes. After all, you're not the only one that feels broken. She gestured to her wound, her fingers stopping short of touching it. The other elves, they are happy I have been saved, do not doubt that, but they look at me differently, as if I am some terrible accident, a monster like the Vorgs, their poison in my very blood. I am a tragedy now, a sigh, a pause in the conversation when you shake your head and say, she was beautiful once, it is so sad, then move on. Hale took a deep breath. He could feel the coldness of the air in his throat and lungs. Why did he want to reach out and take her hand in his so much just then? I still think you are beautiful. The Vorgs can't change who you are. She wiped her eyes and shook her head. He could see her writing herself. The pain she had let him glimpse was being shielded again, behind iron walls. He wondered if Val had felt the same sense of inadequacy when Hale had tried to push the captain away. How he wished he had the words Val did, to soothe her, to answer the questions raging in her mind. But his mouth froze. His thoughts stuck on the fact that he simply wanted to touch her, console her. His hands began to tremble. He made fists and looked away, thankful for the darkness to cover his awkwardness. Restraint was best, he told himself. Who was he to do such a thing as reach out and to make contact, to be so presumptuous? After all, she was an elf, and he... 
He was descended from a traitor who had betrayed her people. We should go now, she said, her voice faint on the wind, her thoughts, he knew, somewhere else. The next morning, back in his room in Sandalin's home, Val roused him from his sleep with a none-too-gentle shake. Wake up, my prince. The elders have made the decision. They're going to send us off this day with guides and provisions. Guides? Who? Val stopped in the doorway, looked back over his shoulder, and smiled. Lazalorn and Caliph. He paused. And I think that sister of theirs, too.